This is the true story of a girl named Farah who survived one of the most historic events in Palestine. The distribution of her film was once blocked by Israel, denying its truth. The story of this little girl's survival is commemorated every year on May 15 by Palestinians during the Nakba Day. This recap contains spoilers. If you have a different perspective from Israel's viewpoint, feel free to comment below. Don't forget to like, share, and subscribe. Enjoy watching. The film begins with the introduction of a girl named Farah. Unlike her peers who love to play, she is a bookish and smart girl. That day, after fetching water, Farha and another girl went to study the Quran with her father. In their village, it's a tradition that teenage girls are matched with husbands and married off. However, Farah dreams of a school for girls in her village instead of marriage. After studying, Farida, her cousin from the city, arrived. They played together, caring for each other like siblings. Farida even wished she could live in the village with Farha. But Farha warned her against it, saying that if it were possible, she would be the one to go to the city for school. Farha loved imagining herself with a school bag, notebooks, and riding in a car. Soon after, they saw British military vehicles passing by. Farha, Farida, and some other children approached the vehicles, sarcastically telling the soldiers to leave, though their words might not have been understood. Back at home, Farah's father was talking with her uncle. They discussed armed troops, machine guns, tanks, and planes, perhaps indicating an upcoming war and the need to form a resistance group. Their discussion paused when Farah arrived with tea. Her uncle was surprised to see Farah grown up. Her father expressed his desire to see Farah married, but her uncle thought she was still young. Supported by her uncle, Farah reminded her father about the school registration deadline next week. Unfortunately, her father had no intention of sending her to school, and Farah returned to her room. When her uncle was leaving, Farha overheard him trying to persuade her father to let her study, but her father remained firm on finding her a husband. Her uncle mentioned that he had slipped a school registration form into a newspaper for Farha. The next day, the mayor tried to convince Farah's father to let her study, praising her intelligence and love for education. He suggested sending Farah to the city for schooling. Hearing this, Farah emerged from her room, insisting, Father, I can study. Suddenly, someone knocked on Farah's door. It was Nazar, the cousin she was to marry, bringing food from his mother. Unlike Farah, who was indifferent, Nazar seemed to genuinely like her. Meanwhile, the women were performing a tradition for girls about to marry. At the same time, Farah's father was discussing with Nazar's family. Seeing this, Farah became upset. When she got home, she questioned her father about his talk with Nazar's family. He replied that Nazar was her intended husband. Farah immediately opposed, declaring she did not want to marry. Seeing Farah very angry, her father then told her that he would send her to the city for school. Actually, her father intentionally wanted to make Farha upset first. Farha was so happy and surprised when her father gave her the school registration form with her name already filled in. That night, their house had visitors. The mayor along with several other armed people came. Farha heard a bit of their conversation about the many Palestinians in the central and southern parts, fleeing and looking for shelter. At that time, Farha's father replied that he would stay in his own village. He would lead the troops in his village if an attack came later. The next day, Farah told Farida that she had gotten permission from her father to school in the city. Farida was very happy to hear it. However, suddenly Farha found it hard to leave her father alone. Farida then said that her father would not be alone. Then she teased Farha, saying maybe her sadness was just because she would miss the bridegroom. While playing, they heard the sound of explosions and weapons. They then immediately ran to the house, but it turned out that the village was being attacked by Israeli soldiers. People were running everywhere to save themselves. Farida's father, who found Farha and Farida first, immediately told them to get into the car. However, Farha instead ran towards her father. Farha's father then brought Farha back to the car and asked Farida's father to take care of her. After being told the way out of the village that was not yet surrounded, their car immediately departed. Just moments after the car drove off, Farha decided to get out of the car and return to her father. In the end, only Farida's family left with the car. Farha and her father then returned home. When her father was seen preparing weapons, Farha asked where they were going. Were they going to Farida's house? Her father then answered no. He had already told Farah not to follow. Not wanting anything to happen to Farah, Farah's father abandoned his plan to take Farah out. He finally told Farah to enter the food storage building. He gave her a dagger to protect herself and promised to come back soon to pick her up. Farah's father then locked the door of the storage. Then he covered the holes in the door with soil. Only a hole under the door and a small hole in the stone wall for light were left. Not long after her father left, Farah heard several gunshots. She felt anxious and worried, but trying to believe her father was okay. Since there wasn't much Farah could do in that room, she looked around to see what was there. Fortunately, she found a kerosene lamp and matches. After a few hours, occasionally Farah tried to call her father, hoping he had returned to pick her up, but to no avail. There was no answer at all. Unnoticed, a day had passed. Farah ate whatever she could eat to fill her stomach. When thirsty, she tried to drink fermented water, which even looked unappetizing. 
Suddenly, the sound of gunfire was heard again. This time, it seemed like the shooting was happening near her house. Because of that, all the smoke from the shooting entered the room. Farah quickly covered the holes in the room to prevent smoke from entering. Night came, and she arranged several bags of potatoes and grains to make a bed. Then, it rained. Farah felt happy. Finally, there was something she could drink. She stretched her hand out of the hole in the wall to catch rainwater to drink. The next morning, Farah couldn't stand the urge to urinate. Finally, she had to urinate in a corner of the room. She used a sack to prevent the urine from flowing everywhere. When bored, she carved potatoes with her dagger or read a book given by Farida. Night came again. Her father had not yet returned. She looked at the school registration form she received from her father. But then, her oil lamp went out. She had been using it for several days, so the oil inside had run out. Not losing hope, Farah used straw placed on a clay plate to make a fire. Unfortunately, it did not last long. Farah then tried to open the door of the room with the dagger given by her father. But her efforts were in vain. One afternoon, a man and his pregnant wife, along with their two children, entered Farah's yard. The wife was in great pain, about to give birth. They sat her down and the husband helped with the delivery. Their baby, named Muhammad, was born, and the father cut the umbilical cord with a stone, and then did the call to prayer for the newborn. Farah, watching all this, felt happy seeing the safe birth of the baby. She called Muhammad's father to help open the door. But before he could open it, they heard the sound of Israeli soldiers approaching. The father quickly told his wife and children to hide in a hole in the wall. When Muhammad's father stepped outside, the soldiers inspected him. Among them was a Palestinian man wearing a sack as a head cover. He was not on the side of the Israeli soldiers and tried to help them release Abu Muhammad. Abu Muhammad explained he was not a fighter, just from another village, and unarmed. But when the Israeli soldiers saw him coming from Farah's house, they inspected it. Abu Muhammad tried to say he just stopped for a drink, but they continued searching. They found his wife and a female soldier checked her thoroughly for hidden weapons. Suddenly, the sound of a baby crying was heard. The soldiers found the children and lined up the family, then heartlessly shot them all. The Palestinian man, whose identity was unknown, had an agreement with the Israeli soldiers not to harm women and children. Yet, the soldiers killed everyone mercilessly. Faro witnessed this and felt shocked and scared. The Palestinian man couldn't hold back his nausea and vomited. Then he glanced at Farah through the door before leaving with the soldiers. Before leaving, they noticed baby Muhammad was still alive. They ordered a young soldier to finish the baby off. But unable to do it, the soldier just covered Muhammad with a cloth and left him. Farha felt sick and vomited. The baby kept crying, but Farha couldn't help him. She tried to break down the door, but couldn't. Frustrated, she scattered the sacks of food around. In her frustration, Farha felt pain in her stomach and saw blood on her clothes. It was time for her menstruation. She curled up near the door, singing a lullaby for the crying baby Muhammad. The next day, she found a wrapped pistol among the spilled grains. She tried to fire it, but it was empty. She then found some bullets in other sacks. After loading the pistol, she shot the door open. Stepping out, Farha looked for water to drink. She found baby Muhammad lifeless. She left her yard and saw her entire village destroyed and deserted. Without a clear destination, she walked away from her village. From then on, Farha never saw her father again. His fate after the diaspora or displacement remained unknown. But Farha believed he was killed in the 1948 al Maqba. Farha, originally named Ridaya, eventually reached Syria. She shared her story, keeping it alive for future generations. The al Maqba, meaning disaster, happened in 1948. It was the destruction of Palestinian society and homeland and the mass expulsion of most Palestinian Arabs by Israel. This occurred following Israel's declaration of independence on May 14, 1948, supported by Britain and the United States. Before al Maqba, Palestine was home to various ethnic and religious groups, including Muslims, Christians, and Jews. During the British Mandate in Palestine, there was a wave of Jewish immigration from Europe and Russia, driven by Zionist ideology. This immigration led to conflict with the indigenous Palestinians, who felt threatened by the plan to establish Israel. In 1947, the United Nations proposed dividing Palestine into two states, one Jewish and one Arab. This plan was rejected by most Palestinians and neighboring Arab countries. In response, Zionist Israeli forces launched military attacks in 1948 on Palestinian areas designated as part of the Arab state by the UN. The aim was to capture as much land as possible and expel as many Palestinians from their homes as possible. As a result, they left all their belongings and memories in their homeland. During the war, over 400 Arab villages were destroyed, and an estimated 700,000 Palestinians were displaced. Massacres also occurred during al Napa. Many innocent women and children were killed by Israeli soldiers. Most Palestinians ended up as stateless refugees in neighboring Arab countries. al Maqba continues to this day with Israel's policies violating basic rights of Palestinians, like illegal settlements in the West Bank and East Jerusalem and blocking access to Gaza. The term Nakba Day was created in 1998 by then-Palestinian leader Yasser Arafat. He designated May 15 as the official day to remember the loss of the Palestinian homeland. 
Every May 15, Palestinians worldwide commemorate Nakba Day. The movie Farha stirred controversy in Israel for depicting the Nakba, the mass expulsion of Palestinians during the establishment of Israel in 1948. However, Farha only portrays a small part of the violence and expulsion during the Nakba. It tells the story of a Palestinian girl who survived the 1948 Al Nakba. Thank you for watching this video. This film is controversial due to differing perspectives between Israel and Palestine. In our view, it highlights the importance of understanding and respecting different historical narratives. Each side has their own story and experiences. It's vital to listen to all sides for a more complete and balanced understanding. I'm eager to hear your thoughts. Please share your comments below. Please support us so we can produce with better tools and with more high quality movie recount. With click like and subscribe. Leave also a comment so we can improve in the future.